Stuff Podcasts. Hello and welcome to The Long Read. I'm Chris Reed, filling in for Michael Wright, who's enjoying a well-deserved week off. This week we're bringing you a story about Centrepoint. It's a companion piece to The Commune, the new Stuff podcast series made by Eugene Bingham and Adam Dudding. And I'm joined today by Adam. Congratulations on the podcast. It's challenging, but it's a compelling listen too. I think you've had hundreds of thousands of downloads so far, haven't you? Yeah, no, we've had a really good, a hearteningly good response to the commune so far. Um, quite a lot of listeners in New Zealand, naturally enough, uh, with all the push from stuff, making sure that people couldn't avoid it for a couple of weeks when we launched it at the beginning of June. But it's had a lot of listeners in Australia, in fact, more Australian listeners than New Zealand listeners to date. Um, there's something about Australians seem to love New Zealand stories, particularly um, ones involving crime. Um, I think you did six written pieces to accompany the podcast series is that right that's right so uh, eugene and i worked on this well it was over a ser- it was over a few years but um it was most of last year is when we we're actually um really digging into making the commune actually i have a confession to make at this point mm. although i'm reading the story and my byline is at the top of the story eugene actually wrote this story because we did all the research together we did all the interviews together we wrote the script together but i was involved in fiddling with the last edits of the podcast proper Um, while Eugene got on with other tasks, such as writing these features, which are uh, sort of digging into um, particular facets of the commune or a person or an issue that we thought was pretty interesting in its own right as a small thing to look at. But yeah, it was Eugene who physically wrote these pieces and then we edited them together. It's good to set the record straight. It's important. Uh, And and just if if you are new to the subject, just tell us a little bit about Centrepoint. Well, the gist of it is that between 1978 and 2000, there was a commune which existed on the fringes of um, the Auckland suburbs in Albany, which was not far from where I grew up, as it happened, which is part of the reason I was interested in the story. Started off as a brave new world of um, open sexuality and lots of therapy and um, a sort of a new way of living, communal living. But there were... There were some very dark things that went on there, particularly in the end. What really brought it down was child sexual abuse at pretty horrendous levels involving some of the most senior members of the place. And as became apparent later, it was going on from from the earliest days. But it took a very long time to, to shut the place down. Yeah, it's a good opportunity for me to mention that the piece that Adam's going to read, and in fact the podcast series itself, does cover some issues that Many people will find distressing, including, as Adam said, abuse and also suicide. Uh, I just want to know at this point that there are a large number of organisations that you can call for help, including uh, the 1737 helpline, which operates 24 hours a day. You can call or text that number, 1737, at any time for support from a trained counsellor. That said, Adam, uh, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about this piece that you're going to read today, one of six companion pieces, as we've noted. That's right. So with with this piece, we just took a close look at one particular guy who was an early member of the of the commune, who saw some of the, the bad things that were going on uh, and left relatively soon and blew the whistle. And one of the sort of tragedies of Centrepoint is that those early whistleblowers like him were essentially ignored, overlooked. We call this guy Robert. That's not actually his real name. He was he, he's spoken publicly with his real name before, but he's just tired of the blowback. So we chose a, a, a new anonymous name for him. But he's just a, a really interesting, really remarkable character. Um, Eugene and I had a really interesting day. The day we went and visited him, he um, sort of cooked us fish and sent Eugene up his avocado tree to pick avocados. He's a real man of the land. And some of the things that made living at Centrepoint so wonderful for him, he still carries through to his to his life today. Okay, thanks, Adam. If you've not listened to The Commune yet, you can find it at stuff.co.nz slash The Commune. And it's also available on all the usual podcast apps. Just search for The Commune. In the meantime, here's Adam Dudding reading Eugene Bingham's piece, The One Who Got Away. When people look back at Centrepoint and talk about what happened there, the top of the toilets and showers 
gets brought up nearly every time. As retired journalist and former resident visitor Peter Calder says, I don't think there's ever been a piece written about Centrepoint that didn't mention there were toilets without doors. People are obsessed with the privacy of defecation. To be fair, the fact that there were communal showers and toilets, with one block of four toilets set out facing each other like four dots on the face of a dice, was unusual. And a lot of crucial moments seemed to happen in the showers. It's as if the warm water and the lack of privacy washed away people's natural filters. It was in the communal showers that Robert, which is not his real name, heard a conversation that shocked and disturbed him, triggering him to leave the place he helped set up. These days, Robert lives a simple life near the sea, south of Auckland. He pulls fish from the water, vegetables and fruit from his lush garden. He's a man of the land, just as he was the day he turned up at Centrepoint in 1978, immediately falling in love with the very dirt the commune stood on and setting to work building its drains and roads. The commune began with a group of people trying to find a better way of living, embracing group therapy and sexual liberation. And Robert was all in. I became a different person in so many different ways, says Robert, who was interviewed on the condition of anonymity for family reasons. I remember thinking, hell, you've done so much for me, I could give you 20 bucks a week for the rest of my life, and that would be not nearly enough for the goodness I feel that I've got out of this. But by the time he left several years later, he felt utterly disillusioned, convinced its guru Bert Potter was leading the community astray. He recalls a meeting where Potter stood up and told his followers, if I tell you to break the law, you'll break it. And in time, you won't even question it. Actually, that wasn't the worst of it. There was also that thing Robert overheard in those showers. Robert grew up in a state house, surrounded by other state houses. In a way, he says, that was his introduction to community living. Mums would chat and sing together as they all hung out the washing in their identical backyards. Dads would share catches of fish with the neighbours. And kids would play down the road until they were called in for dinner. Everyone had each other's backs. And so, when the chance to join the new Centrepoint commune came up, Robert jumped at it. He and his wife and family packed up a trailer and took along everything they owned. Robert had first come into contact with what would become Centrepoint through his wife. She had suffered postnatal depression after the birth of one of their children and had been referred to the Shoreline Trust, a therapy group which included Bert Potter and others who would go on to establish the commune in Albany on Auckland's North Shore. It seemed to help a hell of a lot, says Robert, so much so that she did another one or two groups and I thought I'd go and have a look at this outfit too. Robert found the group therapy, including intense week-long workshops, really helpful. Through the seven days, I'd feel quite exhausted sometimes, but knowing that the Friday was coming up and you were finishing up, I'd feel rather content with where I'd been and what I'd achieved. Potter's therapy sessions pushed people to be more open, including sexually, and there was frequently sex during the breaks. Initially, Robert didn't know whether he could cope. I must have been married about 10 years and I hadn't strayed or anything like that. And I thought, when the situation arises, well, Is it going to be all right? But when the situation did arise, he was fine. I had more than my share probably in that aspect. Yeah, like a pig at the trough. Free sex was something Centrepoint was known for. But that wasn't exactly what attracted Robert. He enjoyed it, sure, but he enjoyed the therapy too. And being part of a group, establishing a new communal way of living. Still, it did have its frustrations one of them being the guru himself. Robert respected Bert Potter's talents as a therapist, but got annoyed that he thought he knew best about everything. Chopping down huge trees, delivering babies, setting up the commune's infrastructure. Potter would always be calling the shots, even when others were more expert. Robert was a drain layer by trade. He remembers one moment when Potter tried to reconfigure the sewage system without consulting him. Because, Robert says, That would be empowering me if he was asking questions. 
He was going to be the bright spark that solved the problem. But it didn't work. Robert could let such things slide, frustrating as they were, until he overheard Potter saying something that disgusted him. That conversation in the open showers. I just hopped out of the shower, says Robert, and he was standing to one side, talking to a couple. Potter started talking about a toddler who'd been in his sleeping quarters and told the couple she wanted to have sex. Robert says Potter graphically described what he then did to the girl. This was a two and a half year old. For Robert, it was too much. That was it, he says. He told others in the community, but no one seemed to care. In fact, some seemed happy. He says, One of the mothers came up to me and said, Bert's just had sex with so-and-so's daughter. She was underage, about 14 or 15. I'm so glad it was him for her. Robert says, I nearly shriveled up inside. By this stage, Robert's wife had told him she was leaving him, but staying in the community. And so Robert decided he had to go. Soon he told the police and started giving media interviews about what he had seen and heard. He even told the local council during a hearing about water rights at the Centrepoint property. His revelations threatened Centrepoint's future. For a while, the pressure went on and police did investigate, but Potter pulled the community into line and things went quiet. Potter and others at the commune who abused children would not be brought to justice until 1991. Looking back, Robert wonders, what else could I do? I told the police. I told the local authority. I told anybody who wanted to bloody listen. And they all knew it was going on. Despite all that happened, losing his wife, watching the commune he helped establish fall off the rails, then collapse, Robert still remembers Centrepoint fondly. It's an education I couldn't buy, he says. I'm glad I had the experience, I really am. I can't say it was nice all the time, but it measures out over 50-50, that's for sure. But what a waste of good energy in shagging it up like that. That was Adam Dudding reading Eugene Bingham's piece about the Centre Point Commune. Actually, make, make it me and Eugene's piece at that point. Oh, OK. We're going to set the record. Is that the finally set in the record straight? It's a joint byline situation. OK. That was Adam reading his and Eugene's piece about the Centre Point Commune, the one who got away. Thanks very much for doing that, Adam. Uh, before we go... Just a reminder that if you found any of the subjects that we've covered in today's episode distressing, there are many organisations who can help, and they include the 1737 helpline. You can call or text and get assistance from a trained counsellor 24 hours a day. This is The Long Read, brought to you by stuff.co.nz. The podcast regular producer is Michael Wright, who's due back next week. I'm Chris Reed. Thanks very much indeed for listening. <laughs>